you're back. Uh, wow, I, uh, sorry, I just, I, I assumed you would have given up after the last video, but I have underestimated your tenacity. Very well. Let us get underway and change some data! First, we need to get some data, as we practiced in the last video. If you missed it, here's a quick recap. Let's say a new lead comes in, and you want to make sure that the first and last name are both in proper case. We can do that. Or you want to be able to count how many deals are on a particular account. We can do that as well. Let's start with the lead question. Let's pull in our lead record using the tools that we learned in the last video. I'll create a variable, call it new lead. And we'll do zoho.crm.getRecordById, coming from the leads module, and we'll have our lead ID. And then let's create a lead. This will be a new lead coming in, and uh, we'll have an example of somehow the form entry was transferred over incorrectly, and Adam Smith had his full name put in just the last name field, and it's not in proper case. Oh, and of course he needs to have a company. Uh, you can be part of the Acme Corporation. Great. And I will take this lead ID, and let's put it in as a variable here. So just reviewing, we get our record this way. And I can take this JSON, if you remember, and we can go to a pretty JSON formatter and take a look at our lead. Obviously not a lot in there, but that's okay. Our main concern is checking the names. So we can look for, so I'll, search, I'll just search for the word name in here. You can see there's a couple of different hits, uh, for example, under the created by or under the modified by, but I also have the full name, the first name, and then the last name. For whatever reason, these aren't next to each other. Don't know why, but just something to know that these aren't always gonna necessarily be grouped together in a way that makes sense. Because that's one of the things about these JSON maps is that the order of the different pairs of keys and values doesn't matter whether it's the first pair or the last pair. Deluge don't care. Oh, look at that. I rhymed. Our main concerns are the first name and the last name. I can pull this information by doing a get on my lead variable for this particular key. So let's go back to our function and I will comment out info new lead. You don't need to see that each time. And we'll go with first name equals new lead, because that's the variable with all the info in it, dot get. I'm trying to pull something out of it and we will put in first underscore name, exactly as it appears in the JSON map here. The other place, if you'll remember that you can find this information, is by going to your CRM settings, going to APIs under developer space, click on API names, find the module you're looking at, in this case leads, and if I search for name, I can see that my two variables are first underscore name and last underscore name. Now that we have our name variables, and I can info both of them, great, now I'm getting their values here in my console window. A note here, or a piece of advice, is when you create your info statements, it's a good idea to put a string in front of them so that you can identify them later. So I'm going to use the plus symbol here to concatenate a string with my variable. And so I'm just going to use the string first name colon space, and I'll do the same thing down here. So again, that plus symbol will join these two values together as one piece of text. And if I run this again, now I get first name, null, last name, Adam Smith. This just makes it a little bit easier if I have a lot of info statements of seeing exactly which value I'm reading is corresponding to which variable. So now we need to run some checks. We're going to use if statements for that. Autocomplete will let me just hit enter after typing if. And as you can see, what I need in my if statement is I need a condition and then and everything in between these curly brackets will be executed if that condition is true. So for this condition, I'm going to say, well, if first name is equal to null, in other words, if it's empty, and you need the double equal signs to mean that you're checking one value against another rather than assigning a value to that variable. Then if I want to add a second condition here, I can use the ampersands for and, or I can use the vertical lines, which 
at least on my keyboard, is right above my enter key by doing the shift. I had never used this key before coding. Uh, that way you can create multiple conditions within a single if statement. In this case, I want to see if the first name is equal to null, in other words, if it's empty, and the last name dot contains a space, then I want to do something. Using the editor with the pencil can make it a little bit harder because there's no autocomplete inside of that window. Whereas if I type this again, if and then I say, well, I already have my variable options here, right? I could say if first name, and then it gives me the different options of my operators is equal to, and then the expression null, again, null meaning empty. Then I'm going to say and, automatically it creates another set of expressions for me. And last name, now in this case, I'm actually not going to use an equal to, or a not equal to, or a greater than, less than. Uh, I'm going to use a text function. Now, because I'm getting the last name from a map, the deluge editor isn't quite sure exactly what data type last name is. So it's giving me the functions available to numbers and dates and text and lists and maps combined. In this case, we're dealing with a string or text. So we're going to use the uh, contains function, which as you can see, returns a true or a false. And I have a little instruction here saying that this will return true if the specified substring is present in the given string. So in this case, I want to check, does my last name contain something? I'm going to check, does it contain a space, right? Because that would indicate that there are two names in there, both a first name and a last name. And there's a space in my last name, but I already have my first name in there. I don't want to replace anything from my last name. So I'm going to only do this if there is no first name defined. Because if there's no first name, but then there is a last name with a space, odds are that's probably a full name that accidentally got put into one field. I need to be able to split up the different parts of last name into two different parts. My new first name is going to be derived from the variable last name. So I'll put that in there. I'll do the dot. And we're going to use a function called get prefix. Get prefix, as you can see, it returns the string before the specified substring. So in the example of one, two, three, dot get prefix two, it gives us everything that occurs before the two, which would be the one and the space. In this case, we're going to uh, get the prefix of a space. And then our new last name is going to be equal to last name dot, care to guess? get suffix and then do the same thing. Now, if I info new first name and info new last name, run this again, there. As you can see, now we have split up Adam as a first name and Smith as a last name. Now for the last piece, I would prefer this to be proper case. It's a name after all, so I would like the A capitalized in Adam and the S in Smith. There is another function for that. So we're going to do new first name proper is equal to new first name dot proper. Proper, as you can see, will capitalize the first letter after every space. So actually, if we wanted to, we could run this just on the last name when we very first get it. For consistency's sake, we're going to just use it twice here. The nice thing about the proper function is that there's no argument that you need to put in. I don't need to put anything inside the parentheses. It's just going to do everything it needs to on its own. Then we'll do new last name proper. And again, you can call these whatever you want. I'm simply naming them this because it makes it easier to read the code later about what each variable is actually doing, right? Now I know that the difference between this one and this one is that this is proper. And so this is not. And we'll have new last name dot proper. And then let's add in some more info statements. Voila. As you can see, now I have a variable that has the correct first name capitalized as it should be, and the last name on its own also capitalized. Let's say that I also would like to know, well, for this particular lead, how many open tasks are there. I'm going to do something called a get related records. For this one, I'll say tasks equals Zoho dot CRM. And instead of getting a record by an ID or just getting any records, 
we're going to do this get related records option, which asks for a relation name, a parent module, and an ID. Anything with a question mark over here is an optional parameter. So you don't have to include it, but depending on your situation, you may want to. We're not going to need any of these optional ones. We're just going to stick with the existing ones, or sorry, the required ones. So first is the relation name. The relation name, similar to an API name, can be found by going to your API name settings. And here I am back on the leads module. I'll clear out my search there. Uh, but right now, as you can see, I'm looking at the fields, right? These are the things that are actually on a lead record. But instead, I want to look at the related lists. What are the other modules that are connected to the leads? And in this case, I will go down to find tasks. And very fortunately, the relation name is also tasks. Tasks is the relation name. The parent module name is the module that I'm pulling from, which is leads. And then the ID here is the ID number of the parent record. In this case, it is the lead ID. And I have my return statement here. So again, I will copy all of this, paste it in here. If you get an error like this, trying to look at any JSON, it could be a label that you put in the front which makes it easier to read in the console. Unfortunately, most of the JSON viewers don't know how to read it. <laughs> so I'll get rid of that. The other thing that might happen is if you have a list of records, which in this case, we got back a list of all the different tasks. The Deluge editor doesn't return the open and close square brackets around the whole list if the list is the only item that's returned. So you may need to add those when you're using a JSON viewer as well. I have a list of all three tasks associated with that lead, all right? We can look at the uh, subjects, right? There was the get Adam's contact info that is complete. Then there is the set meeting with Adam that hasn't started yet. And also the call Adam task, which also has not started. So how am I going to figure out how many of these tasks are open? We're going to use a for each loop. It's going to iterate through that list of information and will execute a certain piece of code over and over on each piece inside of that iteration. So by just typing the word for, there's the option to autocomplete a for each element. I will click on that. So I have for each blank variable in collection. The collection in this case is the list. So I'll say for each task in tasks. I can call this variable whatever I want. It usually helps to just make it a singular version of whatever a particular entry in your list is. Then I could also info each task individually. Inside of this for each loop, as you can see, I only wrote one info statement here, but I got back three different results, one for each task in the list. I'm going to write a piece of code in between these curly brackets that is going to be executed for every single individual element in this list. Now, in this case, an element is an entire map of all of this information about a singular task. And this variable task gets overwritten with the value of the next element in that list. So the first time, that this for each loop runs, task equals the map of the first task. Then task gets replaced with the information from the second task. And then when it goes to the third time, the variable called task gets replaced with the information from the third. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to get the task status. Task status is task.getStatus, which again, I can double check by either looking at the JSON viewer and finding the status somewhere to see the name of it there, or by going to my API names for tasks, make sure I'm looking at fields, and for status, I can see that the API name is also status. Here, I've got all my task statuses. So if I wanna know how many of them are open, then I'm going to need a number that can count. I will start with a variable called counter, and I'll start by setting that equal to zero. As I've mentioned before, you don't have to declare variables. Uh, however, if you know that a variable is going to be iterated on in a for each loop, it's usually best to start the variable before the for each loop to make sure that it already exists the first time you go through it. 
So in this case, my counter is zero and I'll have my task status received. Now I need to do another if statement, right? So it's gonna be if task status is equal to, and what are the options if I look at uh, my map here? So I've got completed, I have not started, and I have not started. So I could say if the task status equals not started, then that would get me all of the tasks that are labeled as not started. So that would be two of them. So in this instance, that is the number of open tasks. However, it might be better to do a is not equal to check in this case, because maybe I have not started, in progress, uh, pending approval, and then completed. I may consider all of the three first statuses to all be considered open, right? I'm more concerned with anything that's not finished rather than just concerned with things that haven't been started. So rather than saying if task status is equal to not started, I'm going to check if task status is not equal to completed, then I want to add a number to my counter. I'm going to be overriding this variable with a new value, but I want it to be a running total. So I always want counter to go up by one. In that case, I need to start by saying the variable name counter equals counter plus one. So if you want to overwrite and get like a running value, you have to set the variable equal to itself and then do whatever manipulations you're doing afterwards. And now if I info counter, you can see that uh, counter does not appear with the first task because it doesn't match the criteria. And then it appears as one for the first one and then appears as the number two for the second. And then similarly, I can also just info the counter just on the outside of the for each loop, number of open tasks, and just see the final outcome. That is some different ways that you can manipulate a variable using built-in functions such as proper, get prefix, how you can overwrite a variable with itself and a new value, uh, as well as how to use variable values in conditional statements to determine the logic of your function's flow. There you are, getting data, changing it around. What else is there? Hmm? A third thing? No, I don't think I ever mentioned a third thing. Three steps. You read data, you transform that data if you have to, and then you send that data somewhere. Okay, maybe there was a third thing. Don't worry, I got you covered. Just stay tuned for the next video, final installment of this intro series, and I'll tell you where to send that data. If you found this video useful, please like and subscribe. And if you didn't, please leave a comment and tell me why.